before I begin, I have a quick reminder. If this channel can hit 5,000 subscribers by July, I'll make a video talking about the entirety of the Kingdom Keepers book series. So if you want to see that, make sure you're subscribed. Thank you so much and enjoy the video. I've been thinking about a lot of the ways the Disney parks have changed in my lifetime. I was born in the late 90s and went to Walt Disney World pretty much yearly in the 2000s. And that was an interesting point in time. There are a lot of attractions I missed out on. I never got to ride Alien Encounter or Horizons, but I did get to experience the original Star Tours and Cranium Command. And the mid-2000s saw a lot of changes to classic attractions, plusing them and adding something new. The most notable of them was probably Pirates of the Caribbean. In 2006, the ride received a massive overhaul at both Disney World and Disneyland. This wasn't just adding new scenes or a few animatronics. This was a reconfiguration of the entire ride story. And I'm just going to come out and say it. It didn't work. From a storytelling aspect and from a technical aspect, I don't think it was well executed. But what were these changes and why didn't they work? Well, let's set sail and find out together. Ever since it opened, Pirates of the Caribbean has been considered the gold standard of Disney attractions. It was the last Disney attraction that Walt personally oversaw. It had the latest in groundbreaking technology. It was a huge advancement in the kind of storytelling that the medium could do. With all that prestige and acclaim, there was kind of a feeling of sacredness around it. Despite Disney never being afraid to change an attraction, for better or for worse, Pirates was seen as too sacred to touch or alter in any ways. A couple of times they did change it, there was a big backlash. Don't fuck with the formula, it's perfect the way it is. That was the conventional wisdom for nearly 40 years. So what happened right around 2006 that made them want to change such a classic attraction? What made them want to buck the status quo of keeping things sacred and change it in such a big way? That's got to be the best part I've ever seen. So it would seem. Oh yeah, that. Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl came out in 2003 and was a huge hit, well received by both critics and audiences. It was the fourth highest grossing film that year, making over $600 million against a $140 million budget. The film turned its main actors into A-listers and created characters that are still fondly remembered today. Disney took a huge risk in making this movie and it paid off big time. Almost immediately after the film's runaway success, two sequels were greenlit. This was the beginning of a new, lucrative franchise, which Disney really hadn't had before. Though, the most remarkable aspect of it all was where it came from. It wasn't based on a book or a TV show or a movie. It was based on a theme park attraction. Disney had attempted theme park inspired movies in the past, but none of them really panned out until Pirates came along. Naturally, the people in charge started seeing dollar signs and realized this was the perfect place for cross-promotion. If we could tie our already well-known attraction to a popular movie franchise, it'd create interest in both. It's practically a license to print money. In 2006, Pirates of the Caribbean reopened with new additions from the films. Davy Jones was added to the cave scene at the beginning, the captain of the Jolly Roger was replaced by Barboza, and of course, Captain Jack Sparrow was put in a bunch of scenes looking for treasure. The ride story went from a group of pirates looking for treasure to a group of pirates looking for Jack Sparrow so he can tell them where the treasure is. Much of the ride remained the same, all the classic scenes were there, but the story was recontextualized to be about the movie characters. Okay, so in order to break down why these changes didn't work, I think it will be easiest to go one problem at a time. These aren't in any particular order, they're just the ones I find interesting enough to talk about. The original version of Pirates didn't really have a main character, because it didn't need one. It was about a group of pirates just looking for treasure. No one figure is given a lot of attention or screen time, and not a lot was known about their histories. So really you could just make up whatever stories you wanted to about them. I think that's part of the appeal of something like Pirates. With no clear-cut story, it gave fans a lot of freedom to come up with their own. The refurb did away with that completely and made it all about Jack. One of the main criticisms you always hear about the later films is that they're all about Jack Sparrow and that he's overused. 
You can think whatever you want about those critiques, but I'm not gonna say they're unfounded. You go back and watch the first movie, and a lot of it is about Elizabeth and Will. Jack's still a main character, but the story wasn't all about him. But as the movies went on, they started using him way too much. No matter how much you like a thing, there's a point where you get tired of it. Like I said, Pirates didn't really have a main character before, but with Jack in the ride, everything is all about him. The Pirates are in Isla de Zorro, looking for Jack. They're torturing the mayor, looking for Jack. The poop pirate is bragging about having a key instead of Jack. The ride did away with the ensemble nature of its cast, pushed aside all the other characters, and turned it into the Jack Sparrow show, which in turn brings up further problems with how it recontextualized the ride's story, but I'm getting ahead of myself. And look, anytime you have a breakout character that's given much more screen time because of their popularity, it's bound to upset some fans. It might have been excusable if the added screen time was executed decently. Unfortunately for us, the ride did not do that. This ties into the problem of making the story all about Jack. It isn't just that he's the center of attention, it's that it feels forced. They didn't take much care into making the inclusion seamless. In order to fit Jack into the story, new dialogue had to be recorded. The problem with that lies in how it fitted into the ride, because the new lines exist alongside the original recordings from the 60s. You have a really crisp, clean, modern sounding line, and then a character will respond with an older sounding recording. Where be Captain Jack Sparrow and the treasure, you bilge rat? Do not tell him, Carlos! No, 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 no! Though they did try to make the new lines match with the classic dialogue from the story standpoint, they didn't try to match it sonically. As a result, it seems forced and unnatural. In fact, all of the movie elements feel kind of forced. Davy Jones is in the waterfall. This is the only time he appears in the whole ride, just to tell us that dead men tell tales. And then they added Blackbeard when Pirates 4 came out. He also never shows up again. Why are they here? I think Disney knew this was forced because it was removed from most versions of the ride. You also see Barboza as the ship captain. That fits alright, even though there's still problems with the sound mixing. However, he only shows up once at the beginning, and then never again. If they were going to go through the trouble of including one of Jack's greatest rivals, the main antagonist of the first film, then they should have reincorporated him elsewhere. But they couldn't, because if they did, they would have to fundamentally change the ride's structure. Bottom line, the movie stuff feels shoehorned in which is even further exacerbated by... The funny thing about the Pirates movies is that, despite being based on the ride, they're wildly different tones. The filmmakers really only took the basic premise and went in a completely different direction. The movies are more of an action-packed epic with lots of big battles and set pieces. The ride is a bunch of pirates sticking around. To be clear, this isn't a bad thing, Part of what made the first Pirates movie work is that they tried something new with the premise. It wasn't worried about shoehorning in ride elements for fan service, unlike certain other films I know. But that becomes a problem when you try to fit characters from this serious action epic into a mostly lighthearted and goofy theme park ride. The Pirates movies could get goofy, of course, but a lot of that was undercut by how seriously it took the story. In fact, that's another critique you often hear about the later films that they took themselves a little too seriously. Pirates 3 opens with a child at the gallows. Pirates the Ride plays torture for laughs. There's a kind of tonal disconnect there is all I'm saying. Another part of what made Pirates the Movie feel so grand and epic was the score. Big, grand, and orchestral as you'd expect. And that works fine there. But among the movie elements added was a loop of the film's soundtrack. It plays during the ship battle near the beginning. That's the only time in the ride it's used. The rest still uses George Burns original score, which is comparatively lighter and peppier. So in the first scene you hear this. In the rest of the ride you hear this. So again, it's another movie element that sticks out like a sore thumb. 
If they wanted to make the pirate's ride fit the epic tone of the movies, then that would have to require a lot more changes. And at that point, you might as well just make a new ride. Which you know what? They did. Shanghai Disneyland has a ride entirely themed to the Pirates movies, and it is infinitely more cohesive. Because they weren't just building on top of an existing ride, it was allowed to be as epic in scope as the films. In short, the movie elements just feel restricted by the structure of the original ride. And overall, I think that's where all this clashing is coming from. But if you thought that's where the critiques end, oh no my friends, there's more. At the time of the ride's opening, Pirates of the Caribbean had some of the most advanced audio animatronics in all of Disneyland. By 2006, though, they were looking a little dated. With the exception of a few figures, most of them were pretty limited in movement, only able to blink, move their mouths, or do basic gesture motions. However, you didn't really notice that. Because all the animatronics were like that, they all fit with each other. Plus, all of the characters were distinct and memorable with Mark Davis's striking character design sensibilities and Blaine Gibson's incredible model work, it created a kind of cartoon realism that fits with the tone of the attraction. They chose to ignore that when incorporating the movie characters. My problem with this isn't that the animatronics are bad. They're good animatronics, they're well made, they have great articulation and movement, and they're super lifelike. But when you integrate a realistic, lifelike character, with more simplistic and cartoony characters, it's not gonna mesh. Maybe the problem with making Jack the center of attention wouldn't have been as bad if the animatronic was more stylized, designed to fit alongside the rest of the characters. But as is, he sticks out like a sore thumb. And I single out Jack because he's the most realistic out of the bunch. Barbosa is also lifelike and realistic, but he's further away and the other characters in the scene are mostly hidden, so there isn't quite as much clashing. I think the scene that best illustrates this is the one with the pooped pirate. The poop pirate is stylized. Rounded face, rounded nose, and a very curly mustache. He's actually fairly faithful to Mark Davis's original design, but out from the barrel behind him is a realistic man. Do these characters look like they belong in the same universe, let alone the same scene? How do I illustrate this better? Let's say you draw a bunch of characters independently of each other. They might look fine on their own, but when you put them together, the art styles just don't match. Normally, that'd be the point where you'd redraw one or both of them to get a more consistent style. The Pirate's Ride never did that last step, so what we're left with is a bunch of animatronics that just don't fit. Okay, Anne, you might be saying, have you seen a refurb handle something like this well, where they introduce new elements but they actually fit? Yes, I have, and it's one from around the same time. The 2006-2007 refurb of the Haunted Mansion tried to do a lot of the same stuff that the Pirates refurb tried. It added in new characters that hadn't been seen before, and it did kind of change the ride story. And I'm mainly referring to the new attic scene. I won't deny that Constance is a retcon. I won't deny that it was a departure from what the scene was previously. I won't even deny that she does fundamentally change how the ride is perceived. But in my opinion, that worked a whole lot better. First of all, the changes were contained mostly to the attic. It's all in one scene. They didn't try to shove Constance into every other scene like they did with Jack. I have seen some people say it's distracting to see a realistic woman in the mansion when all the other ghosts were simple animatronics. I don't necessarily agree with that because there are other ghosts with realistic human faces. Madame Leota and the singing bus come to mind. There's some precedence for that, so it lessens the distraction, in my opinion. But even if you were distracted, it's only in one scene. Second, Constance's integration to the narrative has some precedence. She wasn't pulled from a completely different piece of media. Her inception has ties to the original ride. It took a concept that already existed a woman who murdered her husband, and simply expanded on the story. You can have your own opinions on it, but to me at least, it felt organic. It doesn't feel like any such care was given into putting Jack into pirates. We're coming on my last bullet point, and this might be a bit of a hot take, so please just hear me out. 
Pirates of the Caribbean was one of those rides that didn't have a clear-cut story. It was more open to interpretation, and that was part of the appeal. The most commonly accepted theory was that of the pirate's life in reverse. To sum it up, you have a bunch of pirates pillaging, plundering, and all that stuff in their living years. But when they finally got the bewitching treasure, karma caught up with them and they died. We see how they died at the beginning of the ride, surrounded by gold and unable to use it. And then we saw how they got there throughout the ride. Pirates was written in two acts, so to speak. The first act is showing them after they passed away from greed, and the second act is told how they were in their living years, the lifestyle they lived, looking for treasure. So even though we see them do terrible things to get that gold, we know that they'll eventually get what's coming to them. But the refurb, Jack's more heroic and we're clearly meant to root for him to get the treasure. When he does get the treasure, there are no consequences for him like there were for the pirates previously. That angle is completely destroyed. And the opening scene no longer has context to it. So... How are we supposed to take all of this? When there's no kind of comeuppance or payoff, especially since that was such a big part of the original attraction, what are we supposed to make of this? It just muddles the story and themes. And nowhere is that more explicit than with the auction scene. As much as people like to complain about people being too sensitive nowadays, let me make something clear. That scene has been controversial since day one. Walt himself was unsure about whether or not the scene was an okay thing to include. He expressed concern multiple times before he decided to just trust the Imagineers. You could criticize how the ride depicted such sensitive topics, but you could argue that that was kind of the point. They're pirates, they're bad people, but they'll eventually get what's coming to them. Jack's presence as a pirate we're supposed to root for ruins that. Presumably, he was at least aware that some of this was going down. He apparently did fuck all to stop it or help the women, though. And despite that, he was still rewarded at the end. I'm not saying that the auction scene would still be around if Jack had never been introduced. But his presence makes it less justifiable. <laughs> I wasn't sure how controversial this opinion was. My reasonings might be hot takes, but in general, I don't know how many other people dislike the changes. So I made a poll. I asked you guys in my community tab how you felt about the refurb, which is why you should be subscribed, so you can participate in stuff like this in the future. Anyways, you all came through. Most of you guys seem to like it, but some of you had the same issues with it that I have that the elements were kind of shoehorned in and changed the story for the worst. So it seems like my opinion isn't that much of an outlier. Anyways, now that we spelled all that out, where do we go from here? The last Pirates of the Caribbean movie came out five years ago, and the last good one came out long before that. Its status as a marketable and lucrative film franchise has long since been on the decline. And with the recent trend of changing older attractions to bring in more newer and relevant IPs into them, I think it's safe to say that Captain Jack's days are numbered. A tad ironic that the refurb that arguably started this trend will be succumbing to it sooner than later. Pirates of the Caribbean has gone through many changes over the years. It's arguably seen more than any other classic Disney attraction. And each change is a reflection of the times. Whether that be altering or removing scenes or throwing in popular characters for the sake of it, it seems that this ride, more than any other, will never truly be complete. So no matter what may or may not come in the future, I will be interested to track how pirates will evolve in the next several decades. We can only hope that it's better executed than this. And that concludes the video. Now I'll pass the question on to you. What do you make of this? Do you like the changes? Do you hate them? Could they have been handled better? If so, how would you have handled them? Whatever your thoughts, let me know down in the comments. But that's all the time I've got for today. Thank you so much for watching as always. I will talk to you guys soon. Take care.